right so in the last class we started the discussion of uh, yet another family of logic what we said was instead of having just a recessive load or a pmos based single transistor as a load what happens is we connect up two sets of transistors like this similar to a pseudo and mock kind of structure right and the pull down network still looks familiar that's the same as what we would use in a cmos or nmos or pseudo and mock kind of structure the pull up path right the path it takes the output high is a bit different what we have done over here is we have taken two cmos transistors two networks effectively and connected them back to back okay Now, how does this work? Consider the two outputs, O1 and O2, right? O2 is sort of easy to see. When does O2 go low? Huh? When does it go low? When both the NMOS A and B are on. Okay, so both A and B are on, and they pull the NMOS output low. Let's just ignore the right hand side for now. Okay, just look at O2 along the left hand side of the circuit. So at that point, O2 goes low. Okay, what happens when O2 goes low? What happens to the right hand side CMOS? I'll call them M1 and M2. So O2 goes low, then A and B are both equal to one. Okay. When O2 goes low, what happens to M2? It turns on. Okay. What do I mean by turn on? When VGS across a transistor is high, we consider it to be in the on state. Okay. It's conducting. Eventually, it should settle at the point where hopefully the voltage across it is small. Okay. Enough current flows through it. So M2 turns on. What does it try to do to O1? So O1 gets pulled up. Okay. Now to prevent that from, to prevent any problem out there, I need to only make sure that the right hand side pull down network is not interfered. Right. On my right hand side, if I also had something which is trying to pull down the O1 at the same time, then I have a problem. But over here, let's look at what we have. We have A bar and B bar connected to the input. So there's no real problem over there because the A and B are both high. A bar is zero, B bar is zero. Both the NMOS on the right hand side are off. Okay. So O2 goes low, O1 goes high. What we can say for sure is they are going to be complements of each other. O2 in particular is behaving like a NAND gate. Right? It's behaving like a NAND operation on A and B. Right. What about O1? O1 is now doing the AND operation, the inverse. Okay. Now this we are considered only for one specific case when A is equal to B is equal to one. Let's consider the other cases. Let's say A is equal to zero and B is equal to one. Okay. The moment A becomes equal to zero, the left-hand side pull-down network. What happens to it? The left-hand side pull-down network gets disabled. Right? At least one of those two NMOS transistors is off, so there is no path for the current to flow. Okay? 
this means that there is nothing pulling O2 down. So far there is nothing pulling it up either. So it will retain its own value which is 0. Right? But now look at what is happening on the right hand side pull down network. A drop. As a result of this, now what happens? What happens on the right hand side? What is what are all the transistors that are trying to influence O1? M1, what is what is M2 trying to do? Is M2 affecting O2 uh, O1 at all? M2 is still on, right? M2 is still on, so it's still trying to pull O1 up to VD. Right, because see what is the present state that here at? A has just dropped from 1 to 0. Okay? At the time when A drops from 1 to 0, O2 is still low. This implies M2 is on. But now, M5 is also on. Okay? What happens when you have a PMOS and an NMOS? Both of them are on and they are connected at the central point. What is the voltage that you see at over? It should go to some intermediate voltage. Right? What would that what would the value of that intermediate voltage be? How how do you decide that? Based on the ratio of the sizes between M2 and M5. Okay, so depending on the ratio of the sizes between M2 and M5, you will get some voltage at O1. Okay? If you choose that ratio carefully, then you can make sure that the voltage at O1 goes, what do you want it to do? What should our behavior be like at this point? Huh? We still want the NAND operation and everything in the same way, but now we want it to be controlled by the right hand side. So the left hand side, what should happen to the output? It should go high or low? High. How does the output go high? What's the path for pulling up the output? N1, exactly. So what do I want N1 to do? I want it to turn on. How do I turn N1 on? O1 goes below VT. That is, so that the gap across it, O1 goes below VT minus VT, so that the VGS across M1 is greater than VT. Okay. So if I choose the ratio, choose sizes of M2 and M5, so that O1 drops below VT minus VT. This will in turn make M1 turn off. What happens when M1 turns on? What happens to the voltage at O2? There is nothing pulling O2 down because A has turned off. Right? So M3 has turned off. So what happens at O2? O2 starts rising. Okay? And, and there is no limit, right? It will just basically rise all the way up to VDD. Because there is nothing else influencing that one. If you look at O2, the only transistors that can affect it are M3 and M1 at this point. M3 is off, M1 is on. So naturally O2 will go straight to VDD. Okay? What happens to M2 when O2 goes to VDD? It turns off. Okay. Huh? 
Now M2 is off. M5 is on. So M5 is pulling down the right hand side network. Right? So O1, which has started falling, it went only up to VTD minus VTA or so. Now M2 has turned off. So there is nothing pulling it up. So the pull down will pull it all the way down to J. Right? So at this point what happens is O1 goes all the way down to 0. Final value O2 is at JDD, O1 is at 0. Right? The same behavior will happen even if it had been B which turned off, or rather turned, yeah, where B had gone from 1 to 0 instead of A. Or alternatively, they both go on. Right? Either way, what happens is whenever A or B, either one goes to 0, the left hand side pull down network gets disabled. The right hand side pull down network gets enabled. Okay? The right hand side pull down network has to fight against its CMOS and bring down the voltage below VTD minus VT. As soon as that happens, the left hand side CMOS turns on. It pulls the voltage over there on the left hand side all the way up to VTD. That turns off the right hand side pull up. Okay? And the positive feedback loop gets set up over here. Okay, you pull this down slightly, the left hand side turns on. That in turn pulls up the thing, weakens the right hand side still further, allows the right hand side to go even further down. Okay? So effectively what is happening over here is you have a positive feedback loop which is set up. As soon as either A or B changes value. Similarly, after this condition, supposing A and B both go to 1, right? You can see that at that point the right hand side pull-down network gets disabled, left hand side turns on, now A and B pull-down network have to fight against M1, make sure that it drops below VDD minus VT, turns on M2, positive feedback loop starts, okay? M2 pulls up O1 all the way, that turns off M1, O2 and O1 switch back. Okay? So this kind of structure, I can generalize it and say that instead of having the NAND and combination that I had, I'll put any arbitrary pull down network over here. I know that this output and this output are going to be complements of each other. Okay? I'll call this out and I'll call this out bar. Because I know that at any given point, under static conditions, they are going to be complements of each other. During the transition at some point, both of them will be going through this value where they are switching. But that's only temporary. In the static case, one is going to be 1, the other is going to be 0 and vice versa. Okay? The only important thing over here is TDN1 and TDN2. What condition must they satisfy? They cannot both be on at the same time. They have to be dual or inverse of each other. Okay? Mutually exclusive, meaning that both cannot be on at the same time. That also means both should not be off at the same time. If both are off at the same time, also you have a problem. Okay? 
which means that if 1 is 0, the other must be 1. Right? So, what I mean by 1 is 0 meaning 1 is active, the other must be inactive and vice versa. Okay? So, as long as that condition is satisfied, that is you choose your PDN1 and PDN2 and connect the inputs to them properly. What do I mean by connect the inputs properly? Notice that I had A and B on the left hand side, A bar, B bar on the right. Okay, I cannot connect A and B on the right. If I connect A and B on the right, then when A and B are both one, both sides will be trying to pull the output network down. And you have a content. But if it's A bar and B bar, it means that it's the proper inverse, there will be no problem over there. Okay? So as long as you have this kind of structure, where they are mutually exclusive, any kind of logic and the corresponding inverse of that, so and, man, or, nor, x or, x nor, anything of that sort can be implemented. Okay? Now, what are the properties of this kind of logic? First of all, is it a ratio logic? How many things yes? Okay. How many things no? So why is it not ratio? Any reason? Huh? Is it? Positive feedback, but remember the important point that I made. Unless that CMOS and NMOS bring the voltage down below VT minus VT, the positive feedback will not start. Okay. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. This pull down network and the PMOS above it will both be on, right, for some time. What is the important thing that is required for the positive feedback to start? That intermediate voltage which they bring it to must be below VDD minus VT so that the other PMOS turns on. Okay. So in that sense, because of that, it depends on the ratio of the size. That how much that voltage comes depends on the ratio of the size. Okay. So from that point of view, this is the ratio of logic. Okay. PMOS and the PDN must be sized such that the output will come below VT minus VT so that the positive feedback can start. Okay? Alright, that does not look like a very good sign because ratio of logic, in general I don't want my circuits to be ratio. Why is it that I don't want circuits to be ratio? It's just a matter of convenience, right? It means that I'm losing some degree of flexibility. I have to choose my size of my transistor so that the functioning is at this size. Okay. Instead of that, for the theme of what was the thing, I did, it was not a ratio of logic. So I did not have to worry about the ratios of different transistors. I could use that ratio to modify the VM. Okay, the midpoint voltage switching threshold and so on could be modified by changing the ratios of the sizes. So here I don't have that flexibility. I have to choose the ratio so that functionality itself is satisfied. Okay. So in that way this is not a good thing to happen for a circuit like this. But that's okay. All that it means is functionality has to be taken care of by choosing the ratio properly. Okay. Other than that, let's see if we can think of any possible advantages or disadvantages of this. Right? Is there any static power consumption? Is there any static power consumption in this? Like in the case of pseudo and mass or the recessive load and mass? What happens under static conditions? What do you mean by static conditions? Some of the inputs are changing. They are all either at 0 or at 1. Is there any static power? No. 
right? So that's the plus point as far as this is concerned. Remember, by static power, I'm not talking about leakage and subthreshold leakage currents and all. I'm talking about an active current flowing through the circuit. Subthreshold leakage will always be there. That is different. That is not what we are talking about when we talk about static power. Okay. What about VOL and VOL? What is VOL? VD. VOL? Ground. Right? So VOL and VOL are fine. Rail to rail swing meaning that the output change from 0 to VD. Okay. Another advantage of this kind of circuit is the fact that both the output, out and out bar are being generated at the same time. Now why is that a useful thing? Correct. So if you are trying to build a more complex circuit where you want the output and output complement. Right. One example is that decoder structure that we talked about, right? Remember that we assume that both output and A, A and A bar were present. Right? If I want both the output and output bar to be present, very often what I can do is I can find that the logic which I need can be reduced if both out and out bar are present first. Otherwise I can still realize the same logic but I will need extra inverter. Okay? So there are a number of situations where depending of course on the equation, the Boolean equation which you are trying to implement, it can turn out that having both out and out bar present can reduce the amount of logic or the number of gates that you need. Okay? depends on what you are trying to implement. If it turns out that you don't really need out bar anywhere, then you are just generating it without using it. Right? But in general, this is more from sort of experience from a large number of equations that have been implemented. Very often you do want both out and out bar. Okay? Normally in CMOS what you have to do, you will have to generate the logic, then put an inverter and generate out bar and use it. Okay? So instead of having that, what we can do is, this kind of logic generates both of them automatically. Right? Now that's a plus point. On the other hand, that can also be a minus point because what is the problem with having both out and out bar? This logic requires both out and out bar. So even if you are not planning to generate out bar, that is to say A bar, I consider the input also. It requires both input and input bar. A and A bar were needed for the NAND and combination. B and B bar were both required. Okay? So both have to be generated. If everything is being done using this kind of differential logic, then it's fine, you will automatically have A and A bar. But otherwise, if you are getting an output input from somewhere else, from outside the circuit, you have to invert. Okay? This can also mean extra routing overhead. What do I mean by routing overhead? Extra wires. Right? Extra wires are present over there for both in and in bar, which somehow you need to get them to the correct places. So from the layout point of view, this complicates matters. Extra wires are present. Okay. One final drawback of this kind of logic is that at some point 
during the switching. Right? I made the input such that the right hand side pull down network gets turned on. What happens over there? Both the pull down network and the premons are on. Then after a certain amount of time, some finite amount of time, the voltage would have dropped sufficiently low to BGD minus BT. That will turn on the left hand side premons and then the positive feedback starts. But during that time, that entire pull down, pull up and pull down network are both on. Which means that there is a short circuit effectively between VDD and ground. Okay? Right? This is an important thing to keep in mind. It is necessary for the operation of this circuit because there is going to be some amount of time during which the entire pull down and pull up both are on. The voltage drops below a certain point only then the other side pull up turns on, positive feedback starts and so on. Okay? For CMOS, also you can have short circuit time. Right? It depends on how your input came. Supposing your input Let's say for an inverter, right? The input is changing from 0 to 1. Let's say that the VTs are slightly different on the two things. There will be some point in between where both CMOS and NMOS are on. But that's typically going to be a very brief duration because it's a fa fast transition that's occurring over there. Right? Over here on the other hand, for the very basic functionality itself, you need to have this thing that for some amount of time both have to be on. Then the other side DMOS turns on and the positive back starts. Okay. So the dynamic power that is the power consumed during switching due to this short circuit current cannot be neglected. Okay. By the way, this kind of logic the name that is given to it is differential cascode voltage switch logic. Right? Or DCVSS. The differential is obvious, you can understand why. Both A and A bar, out and out bar, everything is present, right? Both positive and complementary output. Cascoding because of the way that they are connected together, right? And voltage switch logic. The differential, of course, is the most important operative part of this name, right? So you need to sort of understand that by its very nature, it requires both signal and signal bar complement. Okay. All right. So continuing on the analysis of different kinds of logic family that brings us to the end of DC VSL. Okay? There are some interesting things that you can do with DC VSL. For example, when you want to implement something like X or J or something more complicated, right? It is possible that the pull down network between both sides can be shared to some extent. Okay? So the number of transistors in the pull down network can be slightly reduced over what is normally required by sharing transistors between the two pull down networks. Okay. I am not going to go into that in class. We will try to see if perhaps an assignment or something can cover how to do that. Okay. Alright, the next kind of logic family, logic in my implementation style that we are going to look at is the so called fast transistor logic. So what's a fast transistor? It's essentially just treating a transistor as a switch and saying directly I'm implementing some of the logic functionality using the switch itself. Okay? An example is as follows. What is it output at y? 
let's consider a is equal to 1 okay what happens to the output as y it will be equal to b right so whenever a is equal to 1 if b is high the output y will also go high right if b is low then the output y will go low okay this is sort of implementing a uh, and j right whenever a is 1 if b is 0 output is 0 if b is 1 output is 1 okay what do i need to complete this and make it a proper and j i need to make sure that when a is 0 the output system what should it be zero okay so how do i do that huh? i put another circuit over here in parallel what should i connect over there i have two options either i can connect b bar which will also give me the correct functionality or I can just connect it to ground because all that I care about is whenever a is 0 that is a bar is 1 the output will take it and become 0 right so I can simplify it now couple of interesting things to notice over here if the parallel path was not there What will happen to y when a is 0? It is just disconnected from the input. Right? It also you have a switch and you have opened that switch. What is y connected to? It is not connected to VDD, it is not connected to ground. What should the voltage be at y? It is unknown, it will be the Right? Effectively y has been open circuited. So what value is there at y will depend on what value was there previously, the capacitance at the node y and any leakage currents that are present over there. Okay. So in other words y is left floating. Right? And this is an undesirable situation in general. If there is any node in a circuit which is left floating, this is not a static circuit. So, what do I mean by a static circuit? A static circuit is one where at any given point the output has a deterministic path, conducting path leading to either VDD or to ground, not to both. Okay. So it should be possible to clearly identify saying that the output is either VDD or it is ground. Right? By adding the second path, which is the A bar transistor, I have made the circuit static. Because now when A is equal to 1, the output comes from B. When A is equal to 0, the output is directly grounded. So at any given point in time, B is connected through a conducting path. One of the two transistors is conducting and is going either to VDD or to ground. Okay. So by having both of those paths, A and A bar, you make this a complete static circuit. Later on we will come to examples of dynamic circuits which is why we need to make the distinction. Okay, dynamic circuits have other problems associated with them. So for the time being we are looking at purely static circuits alone. Right? Alright. There is one more problem associated with this circuit. What happens when A is equal to 1, B is equal to 1? What will be the voltage at Y? Will it become VDD itself? It will not go to VDD. It will only go up to 
డిగ్రీ మైనస్ ఎయిటీ వాట్ హ్యాపన్ సార్ డిగ్రీ మైనస్ ఎయిటీ beyond vgd minus vt the vgs that is voltage between a and y the output has dropped below the cutoff of the transistor right it does not conduct so there is no way for the output y to rise above vgd minus vt okay this condition is termed a weak one okay why a weak one because it is not going all the way up to vgd going only up to vgd minus vt okay what about zero will go will y go down to vt or will it go all the way down to zero it go all the way down to zero right because a the gate terminal is high which means that the vgs is high the channel is always present as long as there is a voltage difference between b and y some current will flow so y will go all the way down to zero okay that's the only point that is current stops flowing in this this is a strong wave now obviously you can see from the way that we constructed it that you are not restricted to mos transistor pass transistor logic can be constructed using tmos also right how will that behave if i constructed something like this then how does this behave when a is zero the value of b will come through to y okay so what functionality is it implementing y is equal to a bar and b okay but now you need to take care of the condition what happens when a is equal to 1 right when a is equal to 1 that tmos is on is off what should happen when a is equal to 1 a bar and b output should be should go to zero again right yeah Okay. So you can implement all of this logic using CMOS transistor. What's the problem with CMOS? Just like NMOS had a weak one, does CMOS also have a problem? It will have a weak zero problem. Okay. In the case of CMOS, what happens? then this is the condition that is the input is zero and the left hand side that is the drain is that vdd how do i know whether it's the drain or the source it does not matter whichever one is the higher voltage is or in the case of the pmos the one with the higher voltage is the source okay in the case of nmos the one with the higher voltage is the drain from a structural point of view they are perfectly symmetric okay so in this case then the source terminal becomes vdd what happens is current will continue to flow all the way until the drain to source voltage becomes zero that happens when 
the brain also becomes equal to BBD. So a strong one comes through. But if I have this surface, right, and let's say that the output was initially at BBD, it starts draining out, okay, the voltage that the output drops up to BBD. So it becomes a weak zero. Beyond this point, the VGS or VSG of the PMOS is no longer high enough to sustain a channel, no current will flow and the voltage will get stuck at weak. Okay. So PMOS transistor has a problem of a weak zero and a strong one. Well, Strong one is not a problem, strong one is a good thing to have. NMOS transistors have a strong zero and a weak one. Okay? So, what is the implication of having a weak one in the case of NMOS transistors? What happens if I construct a circuit like this? First of all, what is the functionality of the circuit? A and B and C, right? So it's a three input and that I'm implementing with the okay. What's the problem? What will be the output at Y when A, B, C are all high? VGD minus, this will become VGD minus VT. The second stage is become VDD minus 2VT. As soon as it reaches VDD minus 2VT itself, that transistor has got cut off. It cannot sustain a current through it any longer. This means that if I try doing one more stage, this becomes a serious problem, right? How can I avoid this? Using nothing but NMOS transistors itself, how can I avoid this problem from happening? So as a cascading, each time I lose one VT margin, I avoid that. How can I avoid that? Huh? So one possibility is to make A greater than VDD, right? Use A as VDD plus VT. That's an important, it's an interesting way of solving the problem. But is it practical? Is it realistic to use something like that? What's the problem with it? It means that in your circuit you need to have two voltage sources. One is 1.8 volts, another is 2.2 volts. Okay? This kind of structure is used in certain kinds of logic, right? So there are families where, for example, there are multiple levels of voltages, one for the gate one for the drain and so on, okay? But it's a problem because you need to now make sure that you are routing two different voltages across, you use the correct voltage at the correct place and so on, okay? Now, VGD minus VT I can live with. VGD minus 2 VT is a problem. If I say that, then how will you solve it? Huh? Two conducting transistors. There. Connect them in series, right? So you change the structure like this. Put A over here, B over here as before. But now, C comes here. Okay? This goes to VGD minus VT. Well, how much is the maximum that this can go to? This is VDD. Remember the gate is at VDD. That's the important point. So it can keep on conducting till this becomes also VDD minus VDD. Right? 
So this is a simple way of taking care of the problem of cascading. Right? You accept the fact that you are losing this much of margin, one VT margin is lost, but at least you don't consistently lose VT margins on every state. Okay? Now, one thing that can be done with this is, let's look at this first here. How do we get that? A, B, because this is exactly the circuit that we looked at earlier, right? When B is high, A will come through to the output. When B is low, that is B bar is high, B will come through to the output, but anyway, B is low, so the output becomes low. What about the lower part of the circuit? A bar, B bar, so I implemented that. What does that do? When B is high, A bar comes through to the output. Okay? Right? Because when B is equal to 1, that equation reduces to A bar. When B bar is equal to 1, that is B is equal to 0, right? Essentially B bar itself will come through, or rather when B bar is Yeah, when B bar is equal to 1, the output becomes equal to 1, irrespective of what the value of A is. Okay? That is to say when B is equal to 0, the output becomes equal to 1. Doesn't matter what the value of A is. Okay. So essentially this is implementing S bar. Okay. Now the important point about this is this structure. It turns out that by just changing what are the inputs and the positions of these signals, You can implement many different S and S bar values. Okay. <coughs> what do I mean by that? Instead of having B and B bar over here and A B over here, if you implement some other combination of those logic, you could implement the function A or B. The other one would be A or B, the whole bar, that is A and or B. Right? Similarly, you can do X or and so on. Okay? I am not going into that right now, but please take a look at this logic and see how you would implement A or B and A and or B and similarly other kinds of logic using this. Right? So this structure, because of its regularity, is a popular structure that is used in many kinds of implementations. It is called complementary path transistor logic. or CPS. Okay? Alright, we will stop here for now.
in the next class we will look at one final thing as far as pass transistors are concerned, grouping them together to form transmission gates and then move on to the topic of dynamic logic.